Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, a webinar which is organized by Chandigarh Judicial Academy in collaboration with SEC Online. Today's webinar on wills, execution and proof by Justice Rajiv Bhalla, sir, who is a former judge of PNH High Court. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Rajiv, sir, Lordship, that uh, you've taken out time and you will be sharing your experience with us. I was talking to sir and Sir was giving me all the insight about how it's going to be going. So all I can say is very well structured. And like I always say that, you know, the, qu the queries that you might have, you know, will obviously, I think 90%, 99% of the qu queries get resolved because of the speakers that uh, General Judicial Academy uh, brings in. And Sir has needs no introduction. However, as a courtesy sake, I would like to give a small piece of, uh, you know, introduction for Sir. Sir uh, is a blend of a lawyer and a judge. He joined the bar in 1978, practiced on the civil and the constitutional side. Sir was elevated as the judge of PNH High Court in the year 2004, and it, he was retired in 2016. He is more active and regular with Chandigarh Judicial Academy and presently a dean faculty of law in Gunanak Dev University, Amritsar. He is also a practicing advocate in Supreme Court of India. Uh, sir, being so instrumental, and I think now we know because you know, sir is also into academics, is still practicing law. So I think this session gonna be a great session. So without any further ado, I would like to first, uh, you know, convey my regards to sir and request sir to please take it over and you know bless us with his wisdom. Sir, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gill, and thank you for that uh, profuse, uh, profusely. Uh, what would I say? flattering uh, introduction. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, the people sitting here may know me, but now there'll be lots who not uh, who don't know me because it's been four years since I retired. So without much ado and without any. Uh, any any further. Uh, greetings or any further this things, I just wish everybody a good morning and hope I'm able to uh, get in, get you into the depth of a topic which we framed, which but basically pertains to the execution of a will and the proof of a will. I think most of the audience uh, has, and definitely it's almost on a, on a daily basis that the question of proof of will uh, comes before you in a civil suit. So I'll just start by a brief introduction of what is a will. Uh, you all know it. I don't have to introduce you, but since I've got to take you through the topic, uh, it's, it'll be appropriate for me to just briefly give a will. A will, as you all know, uh, is a document executed by a man when he's alive, but which speaks after his grave. I'm sorry, we don't have many graves nowadays, but uh, uh, it speaks from his grave and it uh, determines the course of succession to his properties, both movable and immovable. A will by its very nature is meant to exclude some people or determine the course. And therefore, the mere fact that somebody is excluded is not sufficient actually to eventually set aside a will. That I'll come to later. So what happens is, is the, the will we have uh, an act that governs the execution of the will, and you all know it. It's the Indian Succession Act 1925. So can I just take you straight to the definition of a will? Section 2H. Would you just put up Section 2H? I'll just share my screen. So Indian Succession Act 1925. So it's on the screen, sir. Oh, no, not, uh, really, not required. No, 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 no. You'll required. have to yeah, yeah. change I have the to, page. I have to share this page for everyone to see it. Just a minute, sir. OK, in the meanwhile, before Mr. Gill puts up the definition of will, there are certain uh, expressions which are necessary uh, necessarily to be used, but unfortunately don't get used. 
are the executor of the will or which we all end up announcing it executor it's not executor it's executor of the will is in 2c uh, probate is in 2f and will is in 2h so if it's not been put up i can read it out quickly will means the legal declaration of the intention of a testator now the testator is the person who's executing the will a small request to everybody that please use the word testator in your judgments also uh, instead of executant which is a word used very often by many of us and i'm saying many of us i'm including myself so far as long as i was a judge with respect to his property which he dis desires to be carried into effect after his death so it is the intention of a testator with respect to his property which he desires to be carried into effect after his death now this intention has to be very clear and it cannot be ambiguous and it must relate to some property whether movable or immovable that is the definition of a will so from straight here a question would arise that uh, what is the is there any format prescribed for a will is anything prescribed under the act as to how a will is to be executed what is the execution of a will and then uh, i just refer to a word called probate in 2f uh, if you can just uh, put up 2f so 2f so it is on screen now uh, probate means copy of the will certified under the seal of a court of competent jurisdiction with a grant of administration to the estate of the testator now something very clear over here that this does not apply to punjab and haryana in punjab and haryana you need need not seek a probate you can straight away either go to the authority for entering a mutation if it does so well and good or you can file a suit this is prescribed in section 57 can you just uh, put up 57 so you have to move the uh, may i just read it the provisions of this part which are set out in schedule 3 shall subject to the restrictions and modifications specified therein apply to all wills and codicils made by any hindu buddhist sikh or jain on or after the first day of september 1870 within the territories which at the set date was subject to the lieutenant governor of bengal or within the local limits of can you just move it up so is it visible ordinary civil jurisdiction of the high courts of judicature of madras and bombay so these were the three presidency towns anybody residing there would be required to seek a probate of the will but anybody outside does not require a probate yes if the property is situated there in these then you would also require a probate even if you are situated outside with reference to this uh, there is a section which excludes it at section 213 can you just uh, please put on 213 sir of the succession act no right as executor or legatee can be established in a court of justice unless a court of competent jurisdiction in india has granted probate of the will under which the right is claimed or has granted letters of administration with the will or with a copy of authenticated copy of will next these section shall not apply to cases of wills made by muhammadans indian christians and shall apply only in the cases i am skipping it quickly 57 a and b i have read it quick already 57 a and b is persons and properties situated within the three presidency towns as calcutta madras and bombay so if you are situated within the jurisdiction of these high courts even now you would require a probate otherwise you would not otherwise the only course like in punjab and haryana is that you apply to the revenue officer for a mutation and if he doesn't agree or if you are not satisfied then you file a suit for declaration so can we just now quickly switch to and please uh, my request is everybody keep his questions ready because there'll be lots of them i am right now only taking you through the basic fundamentals of uh, the act now can we come to section 59 i think we skip 59 mm, yes we did so there it is
section 59 every person of sound mind not being a minor may dispose of his property by will uh, we can exclude one explanation one because this is no longer relevant originally there was a time when a married woman uh, there were different rights only if she had the right to alienate could she make it so this is no longer now because now it's an absolute property of the woman under the hindu succession act and now we've even gone a step further she's even become a co-pastor persons who are deaf and dumb or blind are not thereby incapacitated for making a will if they are able to know what they do by it this is a very important provision in fact this is in consonance with the persons in disabilities act also though it was this was made in 1925 so a special provision has been made that you have to ensure that they are not incapacitated for making a will why is this because as you as we'll go later in fact you all more or more most of you know it deaf dumb or blind how will a person who's deaf put his mark i mean read it or dumb dumb or blind how will he put his mark on a will this is a question which will come up for consideration a person who is ordinarily insane may make a will during an interval in which he is of sound mind i can give you an example people are schizophrenic a person who is schizophrenic is not necessarily insane all the time there are bouts of schizophrenia and therefore if during that period is executed a will it will not be illegal for the fact that he suffers from some sort of an insanity no person can make a will while he is in a state of mind whether arising from intoxication or from illness or for any other cause that he does not know what he is doing so these are important things uh, unfortunately when we are looking at uh, uh, a suit we somehow tend not to read these sections we all move from perceptions of what the law is now these are illustrations my request you all when you have a little time i know you all very hard pressed for time always you are meeting deadlines of your judgments everything but please just go through this a little it will help you to uh, understand a few things and maybe sometimes correct perceptions that we have developed over a period of time now can we just go straight to from 59 uh, to straight to 61 so though this will come in later 61 but there's something i want to uh, explain over here a will or any part of a will the making of which which has been caused by fraud or coercion that you all understand or by such in opportunity as takes away the free agency of the testator is void this word importunity is a word we very very rarely use or is a circumstance which comes very rarely this is a word which means that when you harass a person or you you are you can continuously so harass a person that he is left with no option but to eventually give away something to you so as to stop you from that harassment or that continuously heckling him for things or things like that so this is the meaning of that word where you eventually lose your mental uh, balance to be able to judge whether you should do it or you just want to get rid of the man who is trying to get after you all the time so this is the word so and please these are the illustrations now uh, since it's a rather longish subject which we've taken instead of concentrating on one there are two types of wills in the act a privileged will and an unprivileged will most of the wills we uh, execute are unprivileged privileged wills are executed by people in the army air force navy or the armed forces so we will not do de deal with privileged wills those privileged wills came in because when the british were in this country they had their armed forces and normally their people were in india and their families were in england so they they put this uh, into place called an unprivileged will where the army it would be executed and their normal process would not apply so even the commanding officer would attest the will and that would be deemed to be a proper will because he could be at a border and not able to attest a will so that's the that's privileged now unprivileged wills can you just put up uh, section 63 
So, every testator, not being a soldier, employed in an expedition or engaged in actual warfare, or that means un, that's privileged will, or an airman or employed or engaged, or a mariner at sea, shall execute his will according to the following rules. This is a section which you deal with almost every day or every second day. And almost all disputes regarding wills relate to this section. And of course, the suspicious circumstances, etc. The testator, that's the person who's executing the will, please request you all to start using the word testator, shall sign or shall affix his mark. Marks on the will, to the will. Or it shall be signed by some other person in his presence and by his direction. Now, mark can mean uh, his thumb impression, anything else he feels like. The, B, the signature or mark of the testator or the signature of the person signing for him shall be so placed that it shall appear that it was intended thereby to give effect to the writing as a will. I think you all understand what this means. That it must be placed towards the end of the will and at a place where it would show Normally, normal, normal in a writing is the person signing on the right hand of the will, but there's no prohibition in his signing in the center. But generally, when he signs on the left, there does arise a question is why did he sign on this side? And as you all know, there is always people have signatures on blank papers are taken in during many proceedings. So uh, eventually, all this indicates the fact that uh, the placing of the lines, the spacing, the this is where it is written that this is how it must the signature or mark shall be placed that it shall appear that it was intended thereby to give effect to the writing as a will. Now, why I'm emphasizing on this is always we as judges, all of us who have been judges or who are judges, do not quote these sections when we say that the signature is not at the right place or that the the spacing is not correct. This is one provision which I personally feel, lest I leave it to all of you, you are all judges in your own right. We should start quoting these provisions because that's how you carry the understanding of the law further. There will be some youngsters amongst you, some people who are experts in the law, who have been doing it all their life. But still, I think these are provisions you need to start using. Can you just take the next one? C. Can you put up C? Sir, it is, C? Uh, can you see it, sir? It's uh, already on the screen now. Oh, I can't see it. It might be a lag of uh, internet. Uh, just it's, here, it's here. It's come. It's come. So. Now, this is a. Uh, the will shall be attested by two or more witnesses, each of whom has seen the testator sign or fix his mark to the will or has seen some other person sign the will in the presence and by direction of the testator or the received from the testator a personal acknowledgement of his signature or mark or of the signature of such person and each of the witnesses shall sign the will in the presence of the testator. But it shall not be necessary that more than one witness be present at the same time and no particular form of attestation shall be necessary. Now, these are, uh, 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 these are very quick. The first part is very simple in the presence of he should see him putting his signature or mark. But there's one part which sometimes leads to some dispute, but it shall not be necessary that more than one witness be present at the same time. So the question arises if more than one witness is not present at the same time, then how does the testator sign in the presence of the witnesses? The section itself contains a, a provision that uh, or has received from the testator a personal acknowledgement. Can you highlight this part, third line onwards? Or has okay. third line of C or has received from the testator a personal acknowledgement of his signature or mark. So I hope that is clear. So this indicates that both witnesses need not be present at the same time. But if they are not present at the same time, 
then the witness who comes later because the document has already been signed he will not sign it again in the presence of the second witness must receive an acknowledgement of his signature or mark his signature or mark points to the testator so if the if the two attesting witnesses are not present together then the second attesting witness must receive a personal acknowledgement of his signature or mark this is where the execution of a will comes in so in that situation it would be advisable for a person executing such a will to have a little recital at the bottom of the signature of the testator that though he did they did not sign at the same time but the testator acknowledged his signature on the will to the second test witness who signed thereafter signed in the presence of the testator but normally this is missing i have i have still to come across a will with such a recital and therefore it leads to a lot of problems in this now uh, a testation is not defined under the indian succession act but a testation is defined under the <coughs> transfer of property act mr gill has forgotten to write transfer so can you just put it up i'll just uh, put it on the on the website itself straight away so please anybody has any questions on c please keep them ready i'll answer them i'm just rushing through the entire thing so these are things almost everybody knows section 3 or section 30 section 3 3 so so is it visible on the screen Mm, yeah yeah it is it is it is it is uh mm, uh you'll have to uh, 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 slightly attested uh, is the third point of section 3 in relation okay. to an instrument means and shall be deemed always to have meant attested by two or more witnesses each of whom has seen the executant sign or a fixes mark to the instrument or has seen some other person sign the instrument in the presence and by direction of the executant it's the same words which are used under section 63 c so sometimes when you're in a mood to decide on attestation or what to write about attestation you can use this uh, uh, this interpretation clause attested because this is not just for the purpose of transfer of property act this is for everything because a will is also a transfer of property though excluded from the transfer of property act now we come to uh, you can use the word registered also is here which will come later now uh, why is uh, there's a small debate that goes on always that why is execution of will which is also a transfer of immovable property not included in the transfer of property act the answer is right in front of you it the word see the definition of the word instrument means a non testamentary instrument a testamentary instrument is a will which devolves property after the demise so that is why the transfer of property act relates to instruments which are all right so it, that's why it's excluded and it moves only into the from the indian succession act now uh, the problem with this online thing is that you don't have a reaction so it's very difficult to figure out what is happening and what is not happening but i'll wait sir, for the it will, i think it will all come in one uh, one big blow once we have the question that, answer that's now. what happens <laughs> it always happens like that and then lots of things get left out so okay. now so we come to no no some very important things which uh, we may have read in law college or we may have read once in a while but uh, we don't uh, refer to them in our can you just take me take them straight to section 71 of uh, transfer property act or of succession uh, act succession act. act okay sir so it's on the screen now so see uh, in lots of uh, wills 
you say that they are cuttings underlinings overwritings changes which are not signed but we never refer to the section this is the section in the indian succession act no obliteration interlineation or other alteration made in an unprivileged will after the execution thereof shall have any effect except if so far as the words or meaning of the will have been thereby rendered illegible or undiscernible unless such alteration has been executed in like manner as herein before is required for the execution of a will provided the will as so altered shall be deemed to be duly executed in the signature of the testator and the subscription of witnesses is made in the margin or on the same other part of the will opposite to near such alteration etc what i am trying to say is uh, this is the uh, jurisprudential basis for your findings that there are cuttings which are not signed there are cuttings which are additions which are not signed neither by the witnesses nor by the testator so this is your uh, jurisprudential basis and start and and from where you should in my opinion when you are dealing with such things refer to section 71 but uh, more often than not uh, since we are always in a hurry uh, this somehow gets left over i have never used it uh, and i don't know if anybody has ever used read me a reference to it uh, now wording of a will 74 a will can be worded in any manner there is no particular magical formula no particular format no words technical or words of art that can that have to be used i can write a will just a one sentence will that i am the owner of property in punjab and haryana all my property go to person a all i need to do is to sign it have it attested it will be a valid will i don't have to write i am an old man of 70 years old i don't know when i will die life is so uncertain which almost all lawyers have a habit of writing everybody has a habit of writing those are actually superfluous they do not add to the will they are only a reason for execution of a will which has become a norm but actually there's no uh, no meaning for that now please can you uh, section 82 is an important section uh lots of lawyers and judges have a habit of trying to assign a meaning to a will by saying that this is what he meant and this is what he did not mean now section 82 is a clear indicator indication of meaning of clause to be collected from the entire will meaning thereby if you are trying to interpret a provision in a will or a clause in a will or a word in a will it's the entirety of the instrument and all its parts are to be constructed with reference to each other so it's not as if you'll pick up one word from somewhere and one from word from somewhere it's the entirety of the will which will matter you cannot uh, so this is section 82 this is again a section which uh, is is it has to be used both by lawyers as well as this thing when they are arguing for or against a proposition then we come to section 83 so when made words may be understood in restricted sense and when in sense wider than usual now this gives you this is another indicator or a warning to both lawyers and to judges how to interpret a will when to use a word in a restricted sense and when to use it in a wider sense so the words general words may be understood in a restricted sense where it may be collected from the will that the testator meant to use them in a restricted sense words may be understood in a wider sense than that which are usually bare where it may be collected from the other words that the will that the testator meant to use them in a much wider sense now 83 and 82 have to be read together a small request and an advice to you 82 is saying the entire will has to be read 83 is saying how you will read a particular word in a restricted sense and how you will read a particular word in a wider sense so the interpretation is left to you as well yes anything somebody you saying something no sir okay 
Uh, now come to 84. So. Now see this. Uh, see these are all general general principles of interpretation and construction, but they are all contained in the Indian Succession Act. Uh, there are lots of these are all where two possible constructions preferred. What will you do? The former will be preferred or the latter. It says the former will be preferred. I hope we, that's clear. Now we come to 85. No part is to be rejected if it can be reasonably construed. If there is something in the will which is absolutely ridiculous, you will reject it. But if it is capable of understanding and a reasonable construction can be assigned, you cannot discard that as you are not giving meaning to a will. You are interpreting a will and you are not substituting your own understanding of the will. It is the person who executed the will whose will must prevail, whose wish must prevail. As judges and lawyers, we have no right to put in our interpretation or to try and interpret what the man. Meant. The only part is no part if it can be reasonably construed. Then you will go in this manner. It's not that you will discard it. You will first make a, an attempt under section starting from 82 to 83 to 84 to 85. And then only will you come to this conclusion. Because 87 will give you the reason. Testator's intention to be effectuated as far as possible. The intention of the testator shall not be set aside because it cannot take effect to the full extent. But effect is to be given to it as far as possible. So as lawyers and judges, it is no part of our duty to try and second guess what the testator meant. We have to go as it is in so far as it is practicable. But yes, if not, then obviously there will be certain terms and conditions you reach read in the illustrations. I don't want to take you right now to the illustrations because uh, this uh, I, I think you're more or less familiar with it. Why I wanted to go through these sections is these are the basic principles of, of exercise of jurisdiction by a court. And somehow they always get lost in our general understanding or general perception perception of our power. Now come to please come to 88 There's another very interesting section, which though part of your general exercise of jurisdiction where two clauses or gifts in a will are irreconcilable so that they cannot possibly stand together. The last shall prevail. I don't know if any of you has ever come across such a situation. I did it once and then I used section 88 to affirm the last part of it. So this where where they appear to be irreconcilable. Sometimes uh, people tend to uh, confuse the issue when they try to micromanage their estate and try to take it to an extent that I must manage everything and eventually it comes out to be that it just not it's just possible. So therefore, it, it, the act gives you the discretion to go with the last one and not with the first one or don't try and explain it. This is a small request. This is a, basically I'm taking you to I've taken you through the succession act. Now uh, a question comes and comes many times that if there is a will, can you take a succession certificate with respect to accounts, etc.? If it is a will, if you go to Section 370 of the Indian Succession Act, so it's it is specifically that. excluded. which is required by 212, 213 to be established by letters of administration or pro probate. But the question comes in Punjab, probate will not apply. So will it apply to removable property? So please read 370 carefully. 
we do not need a probate in punjab shall not be granted under this part with respect to any debt or security to which a right is required by 212 and 2 established by letters of administration so this applies only to debt and security means accounts it does not apply to immovable property at all i think that's very clear to everybody section 370 is the one the word is debt and property since probates will not come to you they will come to you when you become district and session judges so therefore i'm not uh, traversing that field that's a huge field in itself but there is one small uh, caveat i'd like to add here even if you get a probate a probate is only a certificate of the due execution of the will it is not a certificate of the legality of the will a person can still challenge it on the ground that he did not have the power to execute the will so it's not as if uh, the probate is also the last word therefore it's better like in punjab that we go straight for the suit now there's one more provision uh, where you can execute a will that is under section 30 of the hindu succession act hindu succession act normally dealt with properties which were which came from father to son either copasnary or ancestral but uh, it for the first time granted a right to a hindu to dispose of by will property capable of being disposed of so this would include as per the explanation including his interest in mitaksha kopasnari so therefore it will only be to the extent so even if he is the karta of a huf mm-hmm. or a member of the kopasnari at the most he can only will away his rights this was a big big departure actually from the normal rule that where it was ancestral property you could not that was our customary law you could not ex- execute a will it could not go by will because everybody had a right on the date of his birth and that right increased or decreased with birth and death but this is one exception on which uh, still the debate continues and the supreme court has settled it many times but some of the other it still continues so this is one more provision under which you you have a right to wish execute a will now uh, can i so uh, if you can all have your questions ready on that in the meanwhile i'll just take you to the evidence act quickly uh, you are all aware of section 69 68 and 69 how to prove uh, a will but i'll still uh, sir uh, why is a will required to be proved it's section 68 if a document is required by law to be attested it shall be used as evidence until it shall not be used sorry until one attesting witness at least has been called for the purpose of proving its execution if there be an attesting witness alive and subject to the process of the court and capable of giving evidence now the law says only one attesting witness but uh, as lawyers we insist on producing all of them we also insist on producing the scribe we also insist on producing the person who purchased from where i purchased the paper if it's on a stamp paper we also insist on producing the register in which that paper is uh, writ, uh, is entered that purchased for execution of a will we also insist on producing the registrar we also pr- insist on producing the registrar's clerk we also in- insist on the registrar's uh, the the copy from the registrar so uh, actually the evidence act does not talk of all this but this is because of the inherent uh, insecurities in the system or call it uh, the inherent uh, 
uh, what would I say, inconsistencies in dispensation of justice, that in one particular set of facts, the trial court uh, accepts a will, and on that very fact, the district court discards it, the high court passes another order, and the Supreme Court a fourth order. So what the lawyer does, he tries and puts in everything possible, though section 68 only requires this. It requires nothing more. And the attesting witness has to depose in terms of section 63, nothing more. Now, uh, I think we needn't go into all this proof of uh, uh, when no attesting witness found admission of execution of party to attested documents, proof when attesting witness denies execution. These are all sections I think you're all aware of. You do this work every day. And then comparison of signatures is section 73 in this very act. But normally the order gets passed under the CPC. Nobody refers to section 3, 73. And along with that, we have section 44 that sometimes somebody does refer to it. Opinion of experts. Section 45. So. So basically proof of a will is in section 68. Now coming to. Who is to prove the execution of the will? It's all almost always very clear that the person who propounds the will has to prove the will. So whether it is the defendant or the claimant, it is or the plaintiff, he has to prove the execution of the will. That it was executed in accordance with Section 68. Of the Indian Succession Act. And he has to prove that in accordance with the Indian Evidence Act 1872. The Evidence Act only lays down a minimum criteria of proof. Therefore, it is for this reason that as lawyers and we end up producing so many other things, not just this, because you never know one honorable judge may say, OK, one witness is not enough. This seems to be a little doubtful, so you put in the second one. Then you may still say it's still not very even. So you put in the scribe, then you get the registers and then you get the registration act. So all these documents together. Help to discharge. The burden of. Execution of the will. Only. That the execute that the will has been executed in accordance with provisions of the Indian Succession Act and proved to have been so executed in accordance with proof of the of the Evidence Act. Now the question that arises is if that is so, then why isn't it decreed? Why aren't all wills decreed if a person comes in? Now the law is very clear that you may prove execution of a will, but eventually you have to dispel any suspicion arising around the execution of the will. Now that suspicion will be fraud, coercion, undue influence and various other factors uh, like beneficiary participating, beneficiary uh, not able to uh, not able to explain how we came in possession of the will. Exclusion of class one heirs, exclusion of minors, exclusion of wife, exclusion of daughters and there are 101 circumstances. Maybe that uh, you got the Lombardar from this village, whereas the person was residing in another village. Nobody knew it. You got the Sarpanch. So there, there are 101 circumstances which I can keep on delimiting and we can continue for the entire day. But no one, in my opinion, and that is the law, no one circumstance is sufficient to discard a will. It is this bouquet of circumstances which when read together will enable you as a judge to say that the suspicious circumstances pervading the execution of the will do not enable me to uphold the will even if its execution has been proved. 
I am not uh, bound merely because execution has been proved to discuss to accept a will and close my eyes to suspicious circumstances. Now, merely because a daughter has been has been uh, disowned is not a circumstance sufficient. It is one circumstance. Similarly, with a wife. Similarly, with children. But normally, in courts, we always take it as a serious circumstance. Particularly if there's no explanation. If there's no explanation, then almost as a matter of rule, we raise a serious doubt on the execution of the will. If there's an explanation, then I, it was for this reason that I read out to you those sections of the of the Succession Act that you are not to put in your thought process. You've got to examine the entire will. Look at the sections, go through them, and then come to a conclusion in accordance with the provisions of the Succession Act. What we tend to do is we tend to say daughters excluded, no reason given, will set aside, and maybe one other reason or something. But please, my request to all of you is please look at the provisions of the Indian Succession Act, those section 68 and all which I had requested you to, uh, which I read out. Purposely for this reason, uh, 71, 74, all those sections which are there, those are very important sections, but somehow get ignored or nobody pays sufficient uh, attention to them. Now, an important fact which require is this thing that a will does not require registration. There is no provision in any law that mandates the registration of a will. I can, if I feel like, I can just on a plain simple paper, I can get it typed, I can write it in my handwriting. A handwritten will is also called a holographic will. The one which I write on my own hand is called a holographic will. Now I'll just take you to the Registration Act. A will is presented under Section 40 to the Registrar. So it's on the screen. So it's presented there and then there's a complete procedure prescribed of photographing the people. Each state has its own procedure. Punjab has a different procedure. Haryana has a different procedure. So luckily you don't get transferred from one state to the other. So that procedure for you is consistent always. And then there is also a deposit of title of wills in section 41 and 42, 42, which remains with him and it is to be uh, uh, given only after the person dies. So there are two circumstances. Then there's also a provision for registration of a will after the death of the testator. It's not necessary that he has to, it has to be registered. It can be registered even after death. So please look at these provisions. They are all there with you. Uh, and uh, everything is contained in this. Now, I think I've uh, quickly rushed through everything, but uh, the basic Bible of proof of will is one judgment, and I generally do not go beyond that judgment. It's a very old judgment, but basic judgment, and I think all of you have been taught that judgment. It is AIR 1959 Supreme Court. Can you just put up the page? So, there it is. So in my opinion, please don't. You can keep on supplementing this judgment with any amount. But this is the basic, uh, I would say, the Bible, the Quran, the Gita, or whatever it is, of proof of will, onus of will. And this has been followed consistently since 1959. How many years? You can calculate. So this is one judgment which holds the feast today, play, uh, holds the feel even today, despite pa passage of so many years. This is the judgment which started. We uh, basically held that onus is on the propounder and it is for the propounder to dispel all suspicious circumstances. I have seen judgments where uh, honorable judges have held that the, uh, the plaintiff or the defendant has not raised any plea that there are any suspicious circumstances. 
and therefore because he is not may not have proved lack of suspicious circumstances therefore i decree the suit it is the remember you are the one who is decreeing a suit you have to decide everything you have to ensure that all suspicious circumstances whether pointed out by the plaintiff or the defendant or not are dispelled suppose there is a will to you in which there is a will and is duly proved but the entire property has to be given has been given to a stranger and that plea is not traced by the plaintiff will you say okay proved witnesses have come everything done therefore he never said that this is a suspicious circumstance i will not no you will not you will it's your job if you look at the sections i have referred to it's your job to ensure that this suspicious circumstances are dispelled by the propounder of the will pleadings are important but here when the onus is squarely placed upon the person opd or opr if you know actually i think in will it should always be opp with propounder written not with just opp so therefore uh, and there are a couple of other judgments if you can just put them up a few so you are all aware of these judgments if anyone wants any more there is a whole compilation available we can give you any amount you want to but uh, i thought it would be better if we just confine it to basic fundamentals and i'll be wrapping up just now in a in 2 minutes those other three judgments uh, can you just put them up so 1991 yeah 1990 in bracket 1 supreme court cases 266 and the third one that you had also that was this one yeah please have a look at these uh, 7168 used in this case cannot be invoked as substitute mandatory requirement 68 now please look at this judgment very interesting judgment i won't try to take you through it but it's a very interesting judgment on section 71 which i just read to you that is uh, section 71 of the evidence act so the attempt was to instead of attesting witnesses to come through the framework of section 71 therefore uh, once it failure deficiency please look at all this it's a very detailed judgment and takes everything forward so after this we can start if there are any questions so should we open should we open, start, like, should we open the question sir yeah please 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 so, please just i will just stop sharing my screen and uh, so So first of all, uh, thank you so much. And uh, like you were saying, that it is, uh, you know, it's it's really difficult because you can't get the sense of uh, your audience if they are understanding. If they have questions, then you have to wait for the last. And I think uh, actually a small suggestion to you all, sir. Like they are doing in IPL, they have that artificial laughter. Now you can also have that. <laughs> I think I think I can do that. <laughs> the real one. But Every I understand. Every evening they have artificial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I was I was watching that yesterday, and I, I realized that there's no one in the stadium, and there was still uh, laughter going on. Now I understand it's the artificial <laughs> one. But no, so I, I understand because this is so difficult to. It's like talking to yourself without knowing that you know how things are going on. But I think we are now in the best part of our session. That is, we have already have questions, so I will uh, start with that, sir. So a lot of greetings uh, from a lot of members uh, for you. So I will just keep it for the last. I will start with a question. a uh, question first question that we have is uh, if a hindu female has executed a will in favor of a before marriage and mentioned that a would inherit all the properties acquired by her in the future also then is it necessary for her to execute fresh will after getting married just a minute uh, okay uh, i don't understand the context of this question Is so there any law? And I'll ask the yeah. person who's asked the question also. Is there any law which uh, is there's a prohibition on a woman executing a will before marriage or requiring her to revisit her will after marriage? The answer is in the question. So 
whoever is put up just ask him to <laughs> see that's the disadvantage of <laughs> the member is hearing you sir and uh, there's an option the person can uh, ask uh, you know a following yeah, question okay. with this ask so, him yeah. ask him because there is so, see those provisions are now all redundant we had read one part which i told you is absolutely redundant regarding women no longer yes is that provision I'll actually just, valid is totally uh, there's that which provision is he referring to i just read it sometime back also yeah i remember uh, that was 59 659 explanation 1 a married woman may dispose by will of any property which she could alienate by her own acting during her life is that the one sir yeah so here it is the answer is right here so 59 of so this is about yes. a married woman so her property she does not have to every person of sound mind it says person of sound mind not being a minor may dispose of his property by will his has to be read as her also a married woman may dispose by will dispose of should be there any property which she could alienate by her own act during her life that's all no longer does a woman have a limited estate these laws or these concepts or these perceptions arose when a daughter had a limited estate and before after marriage she lost all rights in her paternal property as far as private property is concerned there was no law that a woman could not hold private property it was only that if she got it from a father or from a this thing then she could not do it that's all but even that has changed now next next question so, so we're talking about section 57 uh in respect to probate uh yes. says the probate is required only for a presidency towns of bombay calcutta and madras but what yes. is the situation if a person uh, files a complaint in haryana on the basis of a will in relation to the property situated in haryana and at the same time includes the property situated at bombay in the very suit or the application is it required to will, probate or for the will then please read uh, please read this section itself the light on the light light if any part of the property is situated within any presidency town then he will have to go and seek a probate then he will have to seek a can you hear me can yes sir yes sir i am audible yes, can sir. i just read out the provision of section 57 can you sir, just put it up i can put it up sir i'll okay. just put it up on my screen just a minute B. So fifty-seven B. So B. there it is. To all such wills and uh, codicils made outside those territories and limits, so far as relates to immovable property situates within those territories or limits. Now this does not talk about the place of suing. This talks about the need necessity of a probate. if a will is to be probated then the suit will not be maintainable so the question when will arise under the cpc where will you go so if the property is situated in punjab no probate if situated in punjab and chennai then you will require a probate but where you will go will depend on the cpc the provisions regarding relating to cause of action property situated etc etc so in that situation preferably what as lawyers i mean i can tell you from experience what we would do is we would file it in the high court straight and though it's concurrent jurisdiction of the district and session judge and the high court but we would file it in the high court straight and uh, so then lawyers would not object because the other lawyer would also have an economic stake in the case so next question so so we we'll publish this question our next question is 
uh, is the notarized copy of the probate is sufficient to prove the testator's uh, intention? Pardon, your voice was cracking up. Uh, sir, could you hear me now? Yeah. I was saying that uh, is the notarized copy of the probate is sufficient to prove the testator's intentions? No, no. See, uh, in a probate, there is a specific, uh, there's a whole chapter relating to probate. I did not purposely read it because generally we are not here. There's a chapter completely. You have to produce the original will, file it over there. I, I can just, uh, and there are high court rules and orders pertaining to probate. Both the witnesses have to uh, submit a testimonial also before the court. I can just one minute. You can have a look at it later on. I can send it to you. I will give you the entire thing. But notarized copy, no. The original has to be filed. Okay. So that to answer the question. Probate sir. is granted of an original. Now please try and understand the word probate. Probate is not like a decree. It's not like a declaration or a decree or an injunction. It is you are granting the right to execute that document, carry it forward. Probate is defined there. It gives you a right to collect the properties, distribute them. The executor who will be appointed or not or the beneficiary can go to court, prove the will and then he has the right to distribute the bequest in favor of everybody. Whoever are the beneficiaries. So it is not like a decree as such, but still it is still open to challenge on the question of title. These everybody must remember a probate is only a proof of a will. It's not a proof of title. Somebody can come to court and say this is HUF property. He had no right to uh, execute it. He had only one six share. So the will will apply to one sixth only or that before that he had already sold the property. Therefore, no question or he had mortgaged it or and the various other factors. So next question. So the question is now uh, about if the will is in uh, if the can the will be executed in India regarding the property which is situated outside India? Yes, there's no prohibition. OK, and the vice versa, sir? I don't know what the American law is. <laughs> Unless one of them knows it. So because then you have to seek the uh, you have to seek probate over there. Yes. Uh, but I know of a case of a pro of a letters of administration issued with respect to persons residing in India okay. whose father had made a trust in England for right. them and okay. they were giving getting money annuity and they're still getting annuities from there. So everything is inter it depends on what laws are there in that country? Well, laid down, yes, sir. Now, sir, the question about uh, uh, sometimes in court, attesting witnesses identifies their signature. They say that yes, these are my signature, but they denied having the knowledge of contents or state that the testator has not signed in their presence. Or sometimes attesting witnesses are win over by the opposite party. Then how to appreciate the evidence? Should the court intervene and ask questions? The court always has a right. Please read the CPC as a chair, to address questions on any question that it seeks for satisfaction and to be able to arrive at a correct conclusion. The only question is you've got to write reasons as to why you are taking proceeding on that course. As far as witnesses resigning, you there's a very simple method. Once he says it's my signatures, then I think as a court, it's your duty bound to ask him that why did you sign them? Mm. Problem is nobody asks him about that. You let him get away because invariably the lawyer also starts shouting and screaming. Both lawyers start shouting and screaming. So you let them get away. And then here is the provision. Na? One minute, I can just take you to uh, Evidence Act. It's after 68. Section 71. I just gave you a judgment. The third judgment includes section 71. 
if the attesting witness denies or does not recollect the execution of the documents its execution may be proved by other evidence can you just put up section 71 so sir my screen is not being shared see and a small request to everybody that though it's almost uh, advised to you when you become judges that you just sit there uh, to decide what the lawyers bring before you but eventually you are doing justice the lawyer is not doing justice uh, so it's on the screen now evidence act evidence act sir. oh sorry sir so you have to be proactive by proactive i don't mean take sides the difficulty arises when you adopt a particular course without recording reasons there we have it sir i just had a matter as a lawyer and i can give you an example other day from delhi in the supreme court where the judge had decided to pass a preliminary decree now he passed an order saying since there is no tenable dispute i am adjourning it to enable parties to address arguments on whether i should or should not now that tenable dispute part he had not recorded any reasons so we are back now before the magistrate to record those tenable reasons so when you adopt a course please ensure that you adopt reasons i know you are under serious pressure there is lack of time there is so much else to do but when you adopt a course where you are going forward to do something on your own and not the normal thing please record some reasons for that now here 71 is something can you just uh, read some okay. where is 71 gone i just gone. Uh, yeah, yeah i just wanted to increase the text and yeah there it is now so now if the attesting witness denies or does not recollect the election or ex execution of document so therefore you will pass an order in this of to this effect now other evidence that is for the for you the lawyer or the party to produce and satisfy you by other evidence what that other evidence is would vary from case to case please study that uh, judgment the third judgment which mr gill had put up so that is this Second, one 71 is there that is this so that that is this judgment so yeah and read section 70 along with it also so now i'd like to say something on section 70 70 says if he admits it it's admission of the execution of the document correct but this is not enough because he is required to dispel suspicious circumstances also so you just can't use 70 and then say okay and then discard everything else sir. onus is on him next any other question sir we have a lot of questions actually oh god <laughs> i'm in trouble <laughs> so first of all i don't think so you're in trouble sir because there are a lot of i think uh, before even before we you know, go ahead with this i think i should be mentioning it uh, this is a you know a message from vineet narang sir who's a cgm at banala first of all before he asks this question he has uh, conveys his uh, high regards to you now the question that he has put in is uh, is a confusion between a will and a dying declaration and sir has also given a scenario for this the scenario is that uh, that uh, the person committed suicide by shooting himself before doing so he wrote that he doesn't want to give any of his uh, you know uh, property or immovable property to his disobedient son and daughter in law he writes that is all his movable property should be given to his wife he also write that his daughter in law should be made responsible for this act of his suicide now the question the same question that i said in the starting can this be classified as a will as nobody was there when he wrote it and then committed to right or would that this be considered as a simple dying declaration you see it's a simple dying declaration so, as uh, you are all well aware and i have uh, 
reiterated today. I have not invented the wheel. You are all aware of this law. Uh, it requires two things. One, the testator himself. Now, unless he got those two witnesses there also and put the gun on their ears also and told them, please sign. I'm going to shoot myself. So then only would be there. Na? There's no attesting witness. So if the attesting witnesses are still alive also, he didn't shoot them also. Then actually, there's no attesting witness. So it can't be. It, 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 it will eventually also be determined whether it's a dying declaration because he made it. I don't know what was his state of mind also. Mm -hmm. Anybody, in my opinion, I mean, sorry, this is my opinion. And uh, I can stand by it and argue with you, with anybody who can test it. Then anybody who's going to commit suicide is not in his right mind. So there's no question of it being <laughs> even a dying declaration as such. But yes, it can be a declaration that he has been so harassed or so this thing. It can be an abetment of suicide. It can't be a dying declaration as such. It's an abetment of suicide, loosely for the purpose of uh, Mr. Arnab Goswami's television debate. You can say it in that way. Oh, so no. <laughs> and I'm quite sure this is not bad. So, so we will confine it to a. It can't be a will. No attesting witnesses. So, um, another question. Uh, whether it is mandatory that the will should have been attested by two witnesses when the will. OK, it's an incomplete question. Let me read it again. Uh, it's in two parts. So it says whether if uh, it is mandatory to join two witnesses in the will when it is a wish of the testator. And second, which one will prevail out of the will and codicile or both will be seen at the time of appreciation of will? There's slight confusion in the question. So. Uh, maybe I can read it again or uh, can, you, can you just read it again? Sir. Now the first part of the question. So there are two parts of the question. The first part says, uh, is it mandatory to join two witnesses in the will when it's it is a wish of the testator? That's the first okay. part. I'll keep I'll keep answering one by one. Okay, two sir. witnesses. Yes. Mandatory two or more. The law prescribes for two or more. Sir. Section 63. Now next part. Next part says which one will prevail out of the will, out of will and codicil, or both will be seen at the time of appreciation of the will. See, a codicil I had uh, explained to you is defined in section two. Sorry, codicil. Codicil is in two B of the Indian Succession Act. Means an instrument made in relation to a will and explaining, altering or adding to the dispositions and shall be deemed to form part of the will. The will. Okay, if you can just put it up quickly, if possible. We okay. have that to be. Just doing that. Oh. And it need not be that the same witnesses have to come for the codicil. So it's on. They can be separate witnesses. It's like an amendment, an addition, or a whatever you can say. Because uh, till the time the testator does not pass away, he is free to deal with his property. Though people may say that while making the codicil, there was undue influence, pressure on him, etc., etc., that's the separate part. But Codocil is an instrument and which actually your the your second part of the question or the third part is right. Whether it has been validly executed, it also has to be proved as a will in the same manner as a will. So whether you agree, accept it or not, that will depend upon the honorable judges, his discretion and the exercise of powers in accordance with the Succession Act, those sections which I have read out to you and the Evidence Act. Next question. So uh, let me just publish this one. Yep. Uh, moving to the next one quickly. Uh, this question is from uh, Neeraj Goel, sir, who's very, I think, who's very active in all the webinars. Uh, so I expect his name, uh, sir's name, to be there in all the questions answered around. So sir has said that uh, you know 
we talked about uh, the concept of privilege bills, which was incorporated by the Britishers and their soldiers used to be in India and their family used to be in England. Does it mean that privilege bills are not recognized in these days? What if a Absolutely person executes? recognized? Yeah. I, I'm only giving Mr. Goel the historical concept. If he doesn't like history, I'll delete it. <laughs> because I am a big fan of history. So, when I read provisions, I go to the historical basis for a particular provision. Mm -hmm. It's easier to understand. Even today in the army, they have wills which are attested by the commanding officer. All officers execute will moment they come into the army and then they can keep on changing them whenever they feel like. But that yeah. does not prohibit them from executing unprivileged wills also. OK, and now we have a following question. I can give him a little bit of history also. Give him a little bit of more, more history. So why the British put in all these provisions? This Indian Succession Act came in in 1925. Yes. But they actually started this process in the 1850s. When the British came to India in the 1700s, uh, the concept of this great white man was not, it was not there because India was a country which was far advanced than the British itself and had more money also. Mm. So lots of in, um, uh, these people who came in married Indian women. So they invariably ended up having two families, one in India and one in England or they had a family in India. So when the British started looking at all this, they realized that a uh, lot of their their uh, white men, I would say, were becoming Indianized. So if you go through uh, the history and if you go through a lot of uh, the these, what's it called, uh, district gazetteers, you will find all these starting from the 1850s. After 1857, when India was brought under the British, that's the time the call it the uh, Britishization of Indian uh, polity and of Indian this thing began and even the army earlier it was if you remember it was the East India Company. Yes, England was not here that time. They had a charter to trade in this country and they became rulers. So Mr. Goel, a little bit of history is not bad. <laughs> I am sure uh, Mr. Goel uh, understands and they, that, that's why he has a following question uh, onto the same uh, you know, uh, question that he asked. The following question is, if a person has prepared a privileged will and retires from service and does, uh, and does after five years from the date of his retirement, can still, can still his privilege will be acted upon, which is neither not signed by the testator or is not attested? Yes, it will be. Happened? It will be. It will be. That's the simple answer to it. And how can we? It how will. can he prove it, sir? It's because it's. it's see the act, na? Ask him to read the sections of privileged will. Okay. Because see, we are not dealing with today's times where connectivity. Here, you're dealing with people who went into the armed forces and were not seen or heard of for years together. Mm. So you have to. It's always everything is con in the context of a particular thing. It will continue to apply till he doesn't alter it. It's like a very loosely put like a nomination. So for your I'll, account for your LIC. So yes, I'll, anything I'll, else, Mr. Goel? I think sir will. Uh, the part is I can't see anybody. That's always I that's the problem with all. I, I, know, I know. It's, 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 it has it had two edges sword. We have a banner, we have a pros and cons. We can address a lar larger audience in one go, and but the with the you know this uh, thing that we cannot see them. So move to the next one. Uh, this the question is now about again the will. The both the executing witness of registered will are dead, and their family are in abroad and are not ready to appear in the court, not even through video conferencing then how a court should appreciate the will? See, first, the onus to prove the will is not on the court. The onus to prove the will is on the person who propounds the will. If no witnesses can be found, obviously you will have to prove his signatures. Now, if you can't find, if the uh, relatives are not ready to come, and acknowledge the signatures or even on video conferencing, then there are other means of proving it. 
you can get where he was working if if it's in the bank there might be an account where he was working he may have signed something i mean i don't think there's anybody in this world who would not have worked somewhere or the other or would not have fixed even a farmer fixes his thumb impression at the time of taking his crop from the earth bringing his crop to the artiya's place when he gets his msp he puts his so it's still be available this is for the some something will be available that's what it says in section 71 and all these things you can it's up to you any amount of evidence can be led it can't be put into a cast iron so uh, if you can't uh, prove it so go ahead with it that's so, all no if tomorrow you will say even there's no court then what how will you prove it so mm the next question says uh, uh if will is with regards to debt and securities and also other movable uh, other movable and immovable properties then in such a case can a succession certificate still be issued for debts and securities uh, should not be court should desist from uh, uh, doing it right. you should ask them to go and file a declaration because if you see i read out section 21 what was it uh, Wait. Section to you to seventy. What was it? What was it? That was three seventy and two one three. Which one? But but three uh, seventy. Three seventy. And uh, uh, if you can just put it up. I'll do that, sir. Just give me a quick moment. but in punjab and haryana so 3 cent of uh, indian succession act right yes but in punjab and haryana since you do not require a probate so the court can after recording satisfaction or recording an order that this is only for the purpose of a succession certificate and a succession certificate is not a regular adjudication of a will it's only as a summary execution therefore uh, you can issue succession certificate for part of the property regarding bank etc etc but you cannot issue for immovable property and a declaration of a succession certificate even if there is a will will not affirm the will There it is, and three seventy. Three seventy. Yeah, it's taking some time. Shall not be granted under this part with respect to any debt or security to which a right is required by two one two one two one three. That is so, probate and letters of administration. So since we do not have probate and letters of administration in Punjab, you can do it, but you will have to record that this is only a summary procedure. I am not. There is no not proof of the will. This is subject to the party's rights to establish to the contrary in a regular suit. I think because the way, sir, the way you are taking this uh, webinar, you know, in, in a you know different format altogether. Because you know, with everything that we are talking about, you know, you are just referring, taking everyone back to the acts, back to the you know sections and specific sections. You know, I think I've got so many you know uh, regards. Uh, you know you know comments on this that it's really important it's really helpful because rather than talking uh, in the air with only with experience we are all taking them you are taking them back to the basics and i think that's what uh, is the beauty of this session uh well, i think that is most important because as judges we all tend to forget fundamental law and we go on perceptions and sometimes our perceptions are wrong <laughs> that is where law is coming so mm, and that's what jaspin uh, ma'am from jalandhar said the same thing that uh, you know this webinar is very helpful in the sense that it has saved us from referring up the thora of case laws and statutory provision i never i never i you will come to any uh, even the ones which are available i have done with lawyers mm -hmm. i first thing i always excuse myself is that i am not a judgment judgment bound judge mm. 
judgments are crutches which sure. we as judges and lawyers use mm. substantive law is clear there's no point this is, this is my opinion i don't know i may be entirely wrong so i think uh, i'll move to the next one uh, the question is about if ben, uh, is beneficiary acting as a testing witness uh, a circumstance to discard the will like i said there is no no circumstance sufficient to discard a will it will all depends on the depend on the facts and circumstances as to to what extent did the beneficiary who was present during the execution of the will interfere with the free will of the testator so it's not as if uh, <clears throat> and there's a provision regarding that also uh <clears throat> come to section 67 can you put it it's a very interesting section 67 sir of sir of of the indian succession act sir. which we all tend to actually ignore even i ignored it i also read it yesterday when i was trying to refresh my memory on this i'll just do it 67 act itself Sixty-seven. So here it is on the screen now. Now this is not exactly answering the question, but this is something where you can take guidance from. That it is not a circle. Everything a will shall not be deemed to be insufficiently attested by reason of any benefit thereby given either by way of bequest or by way of appointment to any person attesting it, or his or her wife or husband. but the bequest or appointment shall be void so far as it concerns the person so attesting or wife or husband of such person or any person claiming under either of them now please can i mean i sorry there is not a live audience i would ask somebody to explain this <laughs> on a typed answer <laughs> i will i will just i think i am actually a little problem. mystified by this section i mean i honestly admit it because the first part seems to say no second part yes second part says no i think even if the questions will come i have to leave the screen and then see the questions if they are coming over there <laughs> so i think probably we'll uh, by so time i we'll I'll put this up to everybody to explain i this is like this is call it now the interactive so if anybody can explain 67 okay. uh, please uh, and the question is no one circumstance is sufficient to discard a will it's always the call it the bukke you want uh, bukke is not the right word to use but it's various factors combined together whenever you write a judgment on a will and if you are discarding it please don't say that this is sufficient to discard the will first set out all the circumstances which you feel are suspicious why are they suspicious and then after that say that therefore taking all these together i feel this is a will which is suspicious and you've got to remember there is one small thing you need to remember suspicion is the word here it doesn't say that you have to prove it to be you know that it has to be proved to be illegal there is a big distinction between suspicion and proof but at the same time there's a dis- difference between perception and suspicion perception is what happens in tv debates in the evening i hope you got my point yes, suspicion yes. is what happens in the newspapers and proof is what happens in the courts i hope everybody has got the th- difference between the three things so you are somewhere in between you are somewhere in between so it's suspicion you can't have complete proof as to what happened when the person was attesting his will who was there who was not there this is all suspicious circumstances the word is suspicious circumstances so i think if somebody has managed to explain 67 we can go to there or we can move to the next one oh sorry right now we don't have any explanation but as and when it comes i will just uh, pull it up okay. mm-hmm. moving to the next one uh so remember we uh, in the starting we had the first question about marriage of a woman and the will that she has uh done before marriage 
will be applicable after marriage as well when we allow yes, the yes. members to have the class uh, give the clarification on it i've got the clarification yeah, yeah. on it the what does he say so the, the now it says that it's not about marriage of a woman the question really was whether a woman through a will can dispose of a property which she still has to acquire own or possess i you know that's a googly or something so basically it's night uh, we were thinking that the question was about what she has one minute one minute please let me take him back to what is a will uh, can you just take me back to will so uh, could you just please uh, let me know the section two number 2h 2h so just a minute this is my answer the gentleman concerned is welcome to answer it in whatever way he feels like but my answer arises from 2h and uh, there we are so on the screen now h will means the legal declaration of the intention of the testator with respect to his property it's a property in present time yes or you can say property that i may acquire in that situation if there is a chance of an acquisition of a property mm -hmm. a will will always have a clause saying all my properties today or any property that my i may hold on the date of death so whether it is a woman she must be holding that property on that, that date yes until unless there are rights there are certain rights like suppose there is an allotment i can give you an example but the allotment has not fructified into a uh, sale deed by the government department or the or huda puda or whatever they are those things not been executed now that is a tangible right that's a right in property therefore all rights in property by which have which in or a right can be made part of but i don't know what right to succeed would be no well, i think so uh, we uh, you have answered the question because the question was about that she might possess in the future so i think the uh, when you said about that the clause has to be uh, made very clear in the will itself that whatever that she has right now and whatever that she possess she, in the future she can say that if i if if i inherit any other property or i acquire any other property it will also pass there's no prohibition in that so i think that uh, that was the question so you will and let me see if i if you have got uh, the part operative and bonus we have got uh, uh, i think uh, a response on section 67 like we had also yeah please so it says uh, as per section 67 other parts of will we operative that is only request to attestors shall not operate what is the first part i haven't really got anything on that sir no no what i'm saying is the bequest shall be wrong shall be illegal mm. but the will shall not be illegal by reason of his a will shall not be deemed to be insufficiently attested by reason of any benefit thereby being given either by way of bequest or by way of appointment of a person attesting it so and so so and so but the bequest shall be illegal whatever has been given to him shall be illegal but the will shall not be so the question was attesting witness participates is a beneficiary this is the answer there okay now how you take it forward to meet those situations is what i'm trying to say that's why i wanted a participatory sort of uh, um, analysis by everybody so that everybody is thinking and uh, and it's you see in a normal session you can point out to somebody ke please don't go to sleep in this you can't even do that <laughs> all he has to do is to keep himself there and walk off yeah i know but i think the beauty of 
the, the session, the session, you know, require us to be really highly optimistic that everyone is listening. <laughs> But I'm sure sir, these sessions are because these are not mandatory sessions. So members who are joining in, they are you know they're joining with full interest, and that's the reason we are still getting questions. I think uh, I will move to the next one because they said the questions are still coming in. And uh, okay, the next one is sir, if Will is with the regards to oh no, this is we have done this we have done for debt and security. Uh, the next question is. My proposition is if a case there are two person who are beneficiaries in the given bill, I think given bill or bill is okay. In the given bill, in which one is given a right to the testator to have 20% of the sale proceeds in case a second beneficiary sells his property. So this is a scenario. Now the question is whether the first beneficiary could be able to enforce his right against the second beneficiary in the court of law for making him sell the property eventually to the effectuate his own right and secondly whether the first beneficiary would also be required to prove the execution of the will in the said case for both the parties. I will admit the execution of the said will uh, now it is incomplete. Yeah, that's uh, so the last question was that would also be required to prove the second. The first beneficiary would also be required to prove the execution of the will in the said case okay. for both the parties. I can start with the last question first. So anybody who seeks any benefit under any will as a beneficiary or as an executor of the will is required to prove the will. Whether his benefit arises after another beneficiary sells the property or after the other beneficiary gets the property. There can be a case uh, also where the property is in litigation. And as of date, a decree has been passed against the rights of the person who's made the will. So there, there are many situations. Uh, the law, the beauty of the law and the economics of the profession for lawyers is that you can have any amount of situations anywhere. So that, that is the situation. Now, as regards whether he can go to court, he can, yes, go to court and say that uh, he should be directed that first of all, will. Now, in such situations, uh, normally in our part of the country, we don't appoint an executor because probate is not necessary. This normally happens as a letter of administration. Actually, this is part of leisure of, let, leisure of where you have to collect things for the property or you want to dispose of properties and then give it to the beneficiaries. So since we don't have that, he has been conferred a right under the will. So he can go to court to enforce his right. But the only question that will be arise is whether the other person will first of all accept the will to if he doesn't accept the will, then he doesn't have a right. He loses his benefit. So I think that last part was that will admitted. Yeah. So once what happens is so the court will decide the rights of both parties. And that party will take that property that uh, caveat on the right to receive the property will remain meaning thereby if there is no schedule for sale then as and when he sells so he cannot sell the property without giving 20 percent share to this gentleman now the question arise can he go and enforce that right in my opinion he can there is no prohibition in the indian succession act or in any other act because it's a right in law and he becomes a co-sharer to the extent of valuation of the property. And it's if the, in my opinion, there can be no prohibition on that. At least until somebody points out some provision mm -hmm. to me. I mean, I have not come across any. Until unless the gentleman who asked the question knows it, he can make me also wiser. I also learn every day. Certainly, sir. I uh, have not the repository of all knowledge. I think so. I think uh, I heard it somewhere, you know, that people who wear white coat and black coats, they cannot say that they know it all. Because yeah, uh, I, I always maintain and always told even lawyers in my court and everywhere that uh, 
the day a lawyer or a judge says that he knows it all is the day he is going to make his first biggest blunder. <laughs> so you know, it's a it's a living it's a living uh, you know this profession is more of uh, it changes every day. So I think what you are saying is, sir, I think it's it's uh, it's I think it's your wisdom, it's your you know acceptance that learning never stops, and I think that's what mm -hmm. we're here for this in session as well. Um, I have a I have an answer on 67 as well, but I will uh, first take the question because uh, you know we will uh, otherwise be on the same topic. Uh, so the question is, if the will established in succession, uh, succession certificate between the same parties shall operative res judicata in substance uh, subsequent civil seat between the same Ooh. parties. Ooh. It's, no, it's seat, no right? answer is no, so. because succession certificate is summary proceedings. OK. Just like in probate, even a probate does not operate as res judicata. It only operates as res judicata. Probate operates as res judicata regarding execution of the will. Op but regarding the right to execute the will is a distinction point. This distinction. You can file a civil suit even if a probate has been granted. You can file a civil suit even if succession certificate has been granted. Sir, uh, uh, a comment on 67 and then we have a last question uh, which is left. So I'll uh, read out what is written about 67. And it says section 67 says that the beneficiary can be a attesting witness and it's valid attestation and it's valid attestation, but the will is not valid qua the benefit a testing witness gets the will, gets to the will. So I think that's uh, yeah. So the benefit gets nullified, benefit yes. gets nullified, but the will, the attestation remains valid. Yes. Like and suppose he says, I'm sir. giving you a house. Mm -hmm. The how that the bequest will become invalid, but the attestation will remain valid. So that is why it's always said that if you are going to be a beneficiary, go and hide behind the door of the registrar. <laughs> Don't come in front. <laughs> As it is these days, everybody videographs everything. <laughs> so normally the beneficiary is actually right there. <laughs> but he's hiding behind everybody. <laughs> That, that's a new perspective to look at it. <laughs> you know, that's the truth. Ask uh, all of them sitting there. They would say, <laughs> or he's sitting at home and monitoring everything on his cell phone. Mm. Uh, so this is a, this is a request from uh, Jasmine, ma'am. That uh, could we, uh, you know, go through the section 84 of Indian Succession Act one more time. I will share that uh, on the screen. Okay. Which of two possible constructions preferred? 84 and I'll just quickly. Eighty four, eighty four, where is eighty four? Uh, sir, it's on the screen now. So can you hear me? Yeah, can I request everybody to try and uh, give a response? Whoever feels like I, I will also give it. Okay. Somebody can put in an answer. So I have to go on that screen, sir. Uh, so probably okay, what okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. okay I, I'll try it and after that they can all. Uh, so anybody can pitch in with his. So what this means is suppose there's a call clause in a will. Which is susceptible to two meanings. Now I'm not going to give you an example here. Because then we'll go on and on. I think we already one hour and 54 minutes and 34 seconds. I think. Mm. Is that correct? So I also have a throat to take care of. And since I'm a lawyer, I'm, I don't get paid so well for web. I don't get paid for web. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, please don't take that seriously anymore. <laughs> You, you, want, so you wanted you wanted laughter. You're getting laughter. <laughs> no, no, but somebody might take it seriously. They might quote me. Go and quote me somewhere. <laughs> and that'll be the end of my career as a teacher. <laughs> no, no, sir. I, I, I'll, I'll share the I'll share the uh, the also the you know the compliment that we are receiving after the question answer is done. So I think you are you you will be reassured that your teacher your teaching and your uh, profession of a teacher is has a very very people want to want to have you over there so 
No, I, I'm I'm actually humbled by all this, but I'm welcome. Anybody is welcome. Anytime can please call on me. I have no issue. I am very fond of my own voice, and this is the best forum for you to appreciate your own voice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let's go. Let's get back to serious matters. Sir, so. where a clause is susceptible to two meanings, according to one of which it has some effect, meaning it has some meaning. And according to the other, of which it can have none, meaning it becomes meaningless. One interpretation has some meaning, which you, as a, as the judge, will try and find out. And if it does, if it has no meaning, the other part, then the former shall be preferred, which has meaning. Former okay. means the one that comes first. Latter means the one that comes later. Yes. So you will prefer that, but yes, if there is no meaning at all, then you will discard that clause. So, like, let's take a clause. It says, "You shall inherit this property when the sky falls on your head." Now, one part is quite okay. You shall inherit this property when the sky falls on your head. It's not possible. So which one will you prefer? I'm requesting all the judges here to answer this now. The question is as silly as the section. But there is a rational for this section. These are all these sections which I've read out today, which actually even I did not read very often, uh, are actually indicators on how to interpret, read, determine a will. So can anybody, any, any responses, see if any response? I'll see to it, sir. <clears throat> to give it a minute to see if we have any response. I think it's too late. Lunch. Everybody's been deprived of lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, sir, uh, if you get anything, I'll just share it with you. Uh, otherwise, ah, please sir, do. Uh, because see, are... I am as much as much a student of law as all the other people here, and you would I would like to understand how they at the actually they are the uh, they are the fighting front of the judiciary, you know, the subordinate judiciary. They are the ones who are actually, and uh, they are the ones who actually have to answer these questions also. So, so as far as uh, we were talking about. Um, you know, a lot of people have written everything. I think uh, there are a couple of it which I would like to read because uh, it is very reassuring. Um, you know, when we hear from our audience that they really enjoyed the session. One of the I, I'm just going to read one this one because this is everyone has said thank you and they said uh, you know that thank you for sharing your wisdom. There are a lot of comments on the on those lines, but I, I'm just picking up one because this is very very special. It says it's a really a wonderful session, uh, my lordship, and you always like a guiding star to us. Thank you. Thank you. So that's uh, that's I think what you were uh, talking about. I think people liked it. People enjoy it, and I think uh, thank you. It's really important. It, uh, so we are talking about that. It's a lunchtime and everything. We are the receiving end. It's been two hours that you've been talking, and this is two hours on paper. But I know that uh, you were available here at eleven o'clock, and you've been mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, available before the session because we were doing some testing and everything. So it's, for you, it's two and a half hours. And yeah. then you are the one who is talking continuously. So yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm sir, telling you it's a pleasure. <laughs> but I think sir, it's uh, it's our, you know, we must we, we can't thank you enough for sharing this information and uh, people are asking for citations and uh, presentation copy. I would just like to say that uh, this uh, video is getting recorded. So like sir said that sir wants to, you know, loves listening to his voice. So it's now recorded. It will be <laughs> on. It'll be on the academy website. So the entire okay. presentation. Anyone who wants to read on the presentation, but uh, please delete. Please delete all the silly comments I've made. <laughs> so I think uh, I think it's a part and parcel because you know, of the session. Because if he would have been just <laughs> on the point, <laughs> delete this particularly at least, <laughs> <laughs> or, or mute it at that moment. So I, I'll take it offline with you on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do, please do. Get it approved from me first. 
I'll no, censor it. I will, I will send it to you and you, whatever that needs to be taken care of, we'll do that off. And uh, at the end, um, uh, like I said a few minutes back, this presentation would be available on uh, on the Chennai Judicial Academy website. So all the citations that we have uh, cited over here are available over there. I will also, uh, after this, uh, after we are done with this, I will also just stick around. I will put the citation in the chat or let me do one thing. Let me just put it right now so that uh, there's no delay uh, in that. Good afternoon, uh, Lordship. We found some very interesting judgments uh, on some of these topics uh, while, uh, in fact, uh, the session is in progress. But in Mr. case Kuhu. we start popping out, yes, yes uh, good afternoon, Lordship. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, I was also beneficiary. I thought uh, uh, before uh, we, uh, I think, conclude this, I'll say my personal thanks to you for uh, uh, coming and uh, and lighting everyone uh, on. Uh, I think many points, uh, which was, uh, I think, a great learning for all of us. And yes, uh, there are a few, I think, important judgments that I could find while we were listening uh, to your thoughtful, uh, I think, uh, analysis on, uh, uh, I think, very good questions. So what we will do, me and Chetan, we will work and we will, uh, I think, share some important judgments also, the citations also on some of these questions. Uh, we will reflect on everything. We will review and then share uh, the citations uh, with everyone uh, as uh, the notes. I'm sure uh, this will be a very, very meaningful session. Uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, highly, I think, uh, 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 educative for, for all of us. Thank you so much for uh, giving so much of your precious time and making it a very light note, uh, I think, session for all of us. So can I not thank anybody, everybody and switch off? <laughs> <laughs> if the lunch is already served, yes. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me and bearing with me. And uh, thanks a lot. Bye. So, thank you so much. Sir. Have a great day. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Without you, the session would have been of no sense, would have not made any sense. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see you with the next webinar. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Jeff.